Afternoon chat. Um, it's Dr. Jeff Butler and I thought today we'd uh, discuss a topic that I go over with a lot of medical students and residents and, and that topic is, is general bias. So biases that are asserted upon us in some situations that if we don't recognize them we can be taken down the wrong path and it can lead to poor diagnoses. Um, so generally I stratify bias into different subsets and each one is, is harder and harder to avoid um, and can lead to again bigger problems if you don't sort of recognize them earlier on and, and get on top of them. So the simplest type of bias is something I call situation or circumstantial bias. And an example I'll give you of that is if like a 45 year old male came in for renewal of, of his Norvask. So what is Norvask? Now, Norvask is amlodipine is the actual chemical name. Um, and what class of drug is amlodipine? Um, so amlodipine is a calcium channel blocker. Um, and more specifically, um, it's a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. And if you're also thinking in your head, if it's a calcium channel blocker, then it's also a class four antiarrhythmic, you'd actually be wrong in this particular case. Because <clears throat> while some calcium channel blockers are class four antiarrhythmics, amlodipine isn't one of them. But at any rate, so this gentleman's coming in for renewal of his, his, of his Norvask. And you take his blood pressure and it's 110 over 70. Um, he relates to otherwise feeling well. From time to time, he feels a little bit lightheaded, but otherwise his life is going well. So in this particular circumstance, someone who's not thinking about it will just sort of say, hey, this person has high blood pressure. They're out on high blood pressure medication. It looks okay. R fill their script and let them go. But the reality is upper limit of normal for blood pressure um, is 140 over 90. So he's sitting at 110 over 70, which is fairly lowish, and he's describing that from time to time he's a bit lightheaded. So when you question you know, how long he's been on this medication, um, he tells you specifically it's about three years, but over the last year, he's really started exercising more, he's lost 35 pounds, he's in a better position in, um, in his life in general, and feeling really quite well. So what's happened in this particular case, because of lifestyle modification, which we always hope is the superior way by which we can control our blood pressure, he's lowered his blood pressure. And at the very least, he needs less of his blood pressure medication <clears throat> or potentially none of it. So in this particular case, I would instead either half his dose or stop it altogether, depending on how intense a dose he was taking, and then reevaluate him in the weeks to come. And if he continued to do well and his blood pressure was in the normal range, he would be off that medication entirely. So that's the first type of bias that can develop, which we will run into, but it's not too difficult to sort of recognize that one um, and work through it without much challenge. The second level of bias is a little bit harder, um, and this one would be uh, patient-related bias. Um, so something that the patient is actually saying that will push us in a direction um, that may not always be correct. So as an example of that, we'll say we have a... Um, 35 year old female who comes in requesting another medication for treatment of her migraines. Um, she's taking two different types of medication. We'll say for the sake of argument um, that she's taken um, Imitrex, which is Sumatriptan, um, and Axert, which is Almatriptan, with really little to no benefit whatsoever. Um, and on its face, if you accept the fact that this patient actually has migraines, you might get cast down this path of, well, what other type of drug could work? Should I put her on an anti-inflammatory? Should we be working more on lifestyle modification? But you should really take a half step back and question whether the actual diagnosis is correct. Now, I would caution everybody here, whether you're a nurse practitioner, student, resident, you've been doing this for a long time, you do have to be careful and sensitive to how you go about that because you can certainly come across as an asshole or a know-it-all if you just sort of say, hey, wait a minute, just don't tell me what the diagnosis is, let me figure it out. If instead you just sort of say, you know, I can appreciate that you may have had migraines, but can you just, could you stop and tell me the specific details of what's going on just so I can get a better feel for what's going on? In the end, there's a number of ways you could go about this, but you just don't want to be pushy or rude or any of that type of stuff. It just doesn't help anybody. So in this particular case, she relates the fact that she's having pressure along the back of her head that's been present for three weeks. It sort of comes over her entire scalp, almost like a helmet. Um, it's sort of of a mild intensity. She sort of li lists, listed at three out of 10. Doesn't really get worse or better with anything specifically. Maybe if she's lying directly on it, she feels a little bit more, um, but she doesn't give any red flag symptoms. You know, we always ask about those for like, uh, space occupying lesions or, or headaches that are associated therein like incontinence or um, loss of balance or headaches that are worse in the morning or they're making you vomit or anything of that nature. So then that makes you question, does that actually meet the criteria for migraine? Um, so with migraines, there's two things I always tell students to look at. One is recognizing the phases of a migraine. And there's actually four phases of a migraine. 
Um, there's a prodrome, which is a few hours beforehand or sometimes the day beforehand, patients will relate feeling tired or, or moody or just not themselves. And about 77% of people will relate that. Some people describe yawning, something like that. Um, the second phase is the aura, where people will have like a neurological symptom, whether that be sensory or motor. Um, only about 25% of people get that, so it's not a high percentage. Um, but certainly in this case, that's not, that's not present. The third aspect is the headache itself. And then the fourth aspect is the postrome, um, which um, some patients get with migraines, where it's almost like having had a seizure, being what we call postictal, where they feel really exhausted, really achy, something along those lines. So in this particular case, in terms of phases, definitely didn't have one, definitely didn't have two, is in the headache, so three certainly applies to everything, but four, we're not even past the headache, so we don't even know where we stand with that. And that's somewhat of a clue that maybe this isn't migraines in, in, in at all. So if we actually look at the clinical criteria for migraine, there's five criteria that you're supposed to meet. And those criteria are as follows. The first one is that you're supposed to have had at least five episodes that meet the following four criteria. Well, this is the first time she's had this headache, so off the hop, she wouldn't meet that criteria. The second one is a timing factor, and that means that migraines generally last between four to 72 hours. Now, that's not an absolute, so if this patient was at hour you know, 76, she wouldn't be like, aha, it's not a migraine. But three weeks later, like this doesn't quite qualify. The third criteria is that you have to meet two of four criteria. Now, those criteria are that it's usually unilateral, pulsating, of moderate to severe intensity, and it's usually worse with activity. This one's across the entire back of her head. It's more like a pressure, so she doesn't meet this criteria either. The next one, you have to meet one of two criteria, which is nausea and or vomiting. And the second one is you get phonophobia or sound sensitivity or photophobia or light sensitivity. So again, doesn't meet that one either. And the last criteria is that these headaches are present in the absence of a more likely diagnosis that would explain what's going on which in this particular case isn't really relevant because she hasn't really met those other criteria. So again, if we'd taken her at face value and she sort of said, I have a migraine, which sometimes lay, lay people will say because they just associate intense headaches or headaches that last a long time with migraines, we'd have been taken down the wrong track. The reality is this isn't a migraine. On its face, it sounds a lot more like a tension headache. So treatments would revolve around doing like massage therapy, relaxation therapies, medications that would help with this would be more likely um, muscle relaxants and anti-inflammatories, but you certainly wouldn't be adding in another type of migraine medication, which would just be compounding the mistake that was made in the first place. So that's an example of the second type of bias, which is patient-related um, bias, which, which can happen a fair amount, but not too bad to sort of be dealing with this one. The next one is a step higher in terms of avoiding it more specifically. And this is when you get peer bias. Um, so in these examples, it's when uh, somebody at your similar level of, of, of education and medical background has made an actual diagnosis. And it behooves us always to sort of question at some level whether that diagnosis is correct. Not from an arrogant perspective, you know, you can respect your colleagues and a lot of them will make great calls, but there's always some party that should look at this, these cases with fresh eyes. So the example I would give you for that, um, and where I see it a lot with respect to peer bias, is with respect to psychological illnesses. And part of this problem is because psychological illnesses are defined by criteria. So unlike other ailments where you can diagnose it by an imaging study or a lab test, um, this is diagnosed by a series of criteria. And the example I would give you is, um, let's say a 42-year-old female came in um, three weeks prior to your clinic or your facility or your hospital, whatever the case may be, and saw a colleague of yours describing three weeks of poor sleep, um, you know, not feeling herself, depressed for the most part, um, somewhat anxious, um, can't focus, can't concentrate, no appetite, um, feeling globally slowed in general. She was diagnosed with um, um, depressive disorder. She was placed on um, Ciprolex, which is escitalopram, which is an SNRI, SSRI, sorry. Um, and she now is seeing you a week later because she's really feeling no better. Now, in another video, we can have discussions about whether even if that history was entirely correct, whether that would be the appropriate thing to be doing. But for, for this argument, we'll say that this is the case that we're having to deal with. So again, now we're left with this concept of, is this patient actually depressed? Does she meet this criteria? So what is that criteria? So depression is defined as a medical condition that's um, present for at least two weeks that involves depression and or loss of interests. Um, the medical term for loss of interest is anhedonia. And then associate that is four of the following of the following eight criteria. 
Now, there's a mnemonic for this, which all medical students learn, which is SIGI CAPS, which makes it, there's lots to learn in medicine, so you try to remember mnemonics and whatever you can with that. So the SIGI CAPS mnemonic refers to sleep, um, interests, uh, guilt, um, energy level changes, uh, concentration issues, appetite, psychomotor um, retardation or agitation, and then suicidal ideation. So if you have four of those eight plus either depression or, or loss of interest, anhedonia, you would qualify as depression on, on its surface. The key though is always, you know, the the, the criteria they mentioned below those. So when you're, when you're just a nurse practitioner and you're just a medical student, um, you try to hold on to so much that, in, that you just try to hold on to the most relevant facts. And sometimes you just think if you can remember SIGI caps, then you're ahead of the game. But I've always found as you get into clinical practice more specifically, it's, it's the small comments made afterwards that are really quite critical. And the ones below that will stipulate the following. That first and foremost, this has to be a change versus baseline and be moderately to fairly intently um, discomforting for the patient. The second one is it can't be present um, with some type of substance on board that's causing this reaction. So if patients are high on a medication or anything of that nature, they wouldn't qualify as major depression. The third one is it's not diagnosed when something like schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder is more, is more likely to happen. So in the past, we used to refer to that as if there was any hallucinations or delusions on board, so people are seeing things or hearing things, you wouldn't make that diagnosis. And the fourth criteria is that you can't have it if there's significant manic components either, because if there's mania or um, the criteria for mania being met, then again, this starts to push tides towards border, um, sort of bipolar disorders. And intrinsic to that second criteria is that it can't be explained by another condition that might be manifest as well. So when you actually go back to this patient and ask why this started in the first place, the patient relates that three weeks ago their dog died. So their dog who'd been in the family for 12 years passed away and she has just been despondent since. Um, and if you think, if you're listening to this and thinking, well, it's just an animal, um, <laughs> the one you're, you're, uh, you're probably an asshole, <laughs> um, but you're just not getting the fact that we can have really intense bonds with those animals in our lives. So I don't care if it's a bird, if it's a cat, if it's a dog, um, these individuals, these um, wonderful animals are an intrinsic and rich part of our lives. And when we lose them, it's like losing anything else. And I tell residents all the time, what you can't stratify or quantify um, is loss or pain. The reality is people make that mistake where they try to compare, oh, this is more painful or that is more painful. This is a bigger loss or that's a bigger loss. The reality is loss is just loss. You know, So if, if somebody has lost something means a lot to them, then this is what's gonna happen. And in this particular case, this is a normal reaction. This person should be grieving. So I would not have put that person on an antidepressant and I would not have made that diagnosis. This will be grief reaction and certainly we can assist them. So my point being is encouraging them to get potentially grieving counseling or see a psychotherapist, which is immensely beneficial. Try to encourage them to stay connected to people they love. Try to stay active as best they can, although that one's awfully hard when you feel so down. You can certainly help them with sleep, whether you gave them mild sleeping pills or talked about herbal supplements that would help. But that's sort of more along the track of where I would go with things as opposed to giving them an actual medication for depression. So again, so that one's sort of a step up from the other two. The circumstantial or, or situational one is, is not too bad. The patient bias is, is something that usually you can get past. Peer bias is a little bit more difficult. The next level is even higher, and that's one where you get specialist bias. So, and that's something that affects me more specifically because I'm a generalist. And what I mean by that is when, when somebody comes in with either a diagnosis or a recommendation from a specialist, and you're now forced to become involved with this case, and you have to determine whether you're gonna accept the situation at face value. And the example I'd give with you with this one was something that happened to me when I was about six months out. So a long time ago for me, I always remember this case because this mother brought in her three-year-old daughter um, and she related the fact that she'd been having noticed sensitivity to her gums and they'd seen a dentist and the dentist had diagnosed this and she handed me a piece of paper um, and they just were coming here for treatment. And so I open up the paper and on the paper it says herpetic, herpetic sorry, gingivostomatitis which is an inflammatory condition of the actual gum line, secondary obviously to HSV or herpes simplex virus exposure. So I take a look at the patient and while she has inflamed gum lines, I don't see any ulceration and 
it doesn't look like this condition to me. Now again, what makes this hard is not only is this coming from a dentist who should have a lot more experience with gum issues than I should, but I've only been out in practice about six months. But having said that, I've still seen this condition a couple of times, and typically when I saw it, it was more ulcerated, and while it looked inflamed like that, this just didn't fit. Moreover, when I talked to the mum, no one was relating any type of history of type 1 HSV. Um, there was no issues or concerns about abuse here. So it raised the question of where would this exposure have come from? So at the end of the day, I just wasn't comfortable. So inevitably, I ended up sending this patient for a blood test. And so when the blood test came back, there was clearly some disorders that were there. And ultimately, this young patient had leukemia. So well, on its surface, I could have just accepted this note and treated this patient, you know, for something that the dentist thought was relevant, we would have missed the underlying diagnosis. Now, thankfully, this patient had ALL in children, the most most common cancer of childhood is actually ALL. Um, when you look at prevalence rates, ALL affects about three to four um, kids in 100,000 in this age group between sort of two and five. The less common one, which is more aggressive, is AML. And thankfully, that only affects one in 100,000. But it's certainly not a diagnosis that you actually want to miss. But in that particular case, there can be pressure there. First, because I was sort of a relatively new associate, but somebody who should have had more experience than I did um, and I don't fault the dentist. The dentist thought that this was what was most likely going on. But you always have to make sure that you think about what seems more likely and then and then add your input to the actual equation and then they'll sort of move from there. It doesn't mean you ignore the information you're given because you can actually take that and a lot of times, in fact, I would tell you the majority of the time, the specialist input will be accurate, but it's by no means 100%. And that type of bias is, is harder to miss. So the last type of bias that I'll go over with you guys is... Um, is personal bias, is, is what you actually bring to the table as the individual. So if you're counseling patients or patients are coming in to see you and the patient is associating certain emotions with the actual clinician or remembering certain aspects that seem similar and extending that onto the clinician, that's called transference. However, when we as clinicians do it to the patient, so they remind us of something specific or something about the actual clinical history reminds us of something different and we judge it um, for the previous issue and not what's actually going on in front of you, that's called countertransference. And this is something that's much, much harder to treat and to recognize um, because we can all be um, subject to it, but we may not recognize it in ourselves. As an educator, this is something that I have the opportunity to see in others. And so I've certainly tried to sort of explore that with myself as much as I can. And so oftentimes I'll see... Um, an example that I'll give you is if I had the medical student or the resident go in and see a patient who I know has struggled with alcoholism and they can come out and I can just tell that they're edgy. They're just not who they normally are um, and something's bothered them. And, and upon you know asking why specifically they're not quite themselves, they relate that they just don't feel comfortable with these cases. Um, they may relate that the, an individual in their family had issues with alcohol and it didn't really affect them well. But regardless of the situation, if they're bringing that into the room and I'm picking up on it, you know, so whether they actually said to the patient or not that they, they don't respect what's going on or, or they, they're judging them for it, patients will feel that and it's going to compromise the actual interview. And I, I talked before, I don't know if this is something I've released on other videos, but if, if you're sitting across from any type of patient, and it really doesn't matter, there's very few exceptions to this, but if, if you think that you're better than them, um, you've compromised the actual process. Uh, the reality is it's just not accurate. You have to separate out what people have done from who people actually are. And if I use this, exam this case as an example, um, in Canada at least, I, I don't know if this is worldwide data or just Canada, but alcoholism or excessive alcohol intake affects up to 20% of the population. So this is something that you're actually gonna run into frequently. And even though it wouldn't excuse it if it was a very rare thing you ran into, it's certainly something you're going to have to work on. Because if you're bringing that into the actual visits, those visits will be less than optimal. And whatever outcome you arrive at will be not the appropriate one or one that's far from ideal. So that type of bias is, is a hard one that, that, that involves a certain amount of introspection and work on ourselves to sort of correct it. But all of these type of biases can exist. And the more we work on them to minimize them as much as possible, the better clinicians will actually make. So digest that for what it is, and then next time we'll talk about some different case. You guys take care.